Okay, I forgot to email you, but I have posted the demography homework to do life table. Did you all see that? Okay. It's in this week's Moodle. I'll send an email out with, and when, you, when I send an email out with an attachment, what happens? Is it actually show on the email, or do you have to, and then you have to go in, then you have to, that is ridiculous. Okay, okay, so it actually doesn't attach. I thought it didn't. But you have to log into Moodle then to get it, okay. Okay. Oh. Okay. Well, okay. 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 <laughs> so, so that that'll be due um, Tuesday. So the key is what I want you to do. Hopefully, it's clear that you're going to have two different graphs, right? One is going to be survivorship against time, and another one is going to be birth rates or fecundity against time. And you're going to have, how many lines are you going to have on each? Two, right. So you have one for the Mediterranean population and one for the interior population. Yep, that's that one, okay? So make sure that you, you're going to calculate R from the data, and then you're also going to plot the survivorship curves for the two populations on one graph and the fecundity curves on a separate graph. Be asked to interpret those. And you, hope, uh, you should see some interesting, uh, hopefully, some patterns there. Do you want it to be huh? Yeah, I, you know, I mean, you could easily. Now, again, you're not, you're not going to have access to Excel when on the exam, right? But so, I'll leave it up to you. However, you come up with the answer, you can see what I did. Okay, I just cut and pasted from the Excel sheet. Okay. <laughs> You can do that, but remember, you, I, you might want to do get used to practicing it, you know. Okay. Okay. So the last time what we were talking about, um, we talked a lot about exponential or geometric growth, and today what we're going to focus on is there really are limitations on exponential growth, and a lot of times we see populations going to fairly stable sizes and remaining there. Sometimes you have oscillations where they go high, then they drop low, and then they go back up. So we're, that's sort of regulated population growth. But one of the things we're going to talk about today is we're going to extend the, uh, the, um, one of the equations to look at we, what we imagine is as, the, as population sizes increase, r resource availability goes down, right? As the density of individuals in a population goes up, competition for limiting resources goes up, and the availability of those resources goes down. So we expect this sort of negative linear relationship between resource availability and population size. And we expect that that has a direct impact on the growth rate of a population too, right? Such that as a population size increases, the growth rate or small r of the intrinsic rate of increase of the population tends to go down too, okay? And what we're gonna focus just on to, for this part of the lecture is the fact that we're just looking at competition among members of the same species, right? So these are competition among individuals of the same species for some limiting resource. And we're going to focus primarily on what we call intraspecific competition. But we imagine there are a lot of other things that cause resource availability go down. It could involve competition with other species. And we'll be later in a couple lectures talking about what we call interspecific competition. Okay. So we imagine all of these environmental factors from these resource, resource availability has a strong influence on the intrinsic rate of increase or the growth rate of that population. That's what we call small r, the intrinsic rate of increase. Okay, so how do we modify that in the equation we had? So this is what's called the logistic equation. And we're going to be using this a lot. And we're going to use this for looking at the population sizes of a particular species, we're then going to expand it later when we talk about interspecific competition. We're going to modify this equation even further to, to incorporate competition between species. So we're going to be using this quite a bit. And again, how it's derived, the details of it aren't that terribly important. But again, the logistic equation, the basic concept here is we're introducing a new variable, and it's called the carrying capacity. And so you'll see population size is along here, time is along here, and we're introducing a new concept, which is the carrying capacity. Have you ever heard of that before? I bet you, ne you never talked about this in biodiversity, did you? Okay. So carrying capacity is kind of a theoretical concept that basically says this is some uh, limit that's kind of the maximum population size that any particular environment at any particular time can sustain. 
So it's kind of considered a maximum limit to population size. And we call this the carrying capacity. A lot of things influence that. It can be resource availability, it can be temperature, precipitation, all these sorts of resources that might be important that can determine this. This varies a lot among populations, among species, and of course it's really, it's fairly hard to measure this, but again, it's a mathematical concept. Okay, so what we're saying is pretty simple here. So what we've taken is that's the change in the population size of a species over time. Here's the original part that we had where we just had the intrinsic rate of increase times n. And what happens when that value is above zero? It just continues to grow without limit. So here's what the equation looks like is this blue line when you don't have this component in the equation. So this is the line for r sub n, and you get that exponential growth rate. What's different about when you incorporate this happens to that the growth of the population from low density to a higher density? So it levels off or asymptotes off, right? So you get this asymptote where you get, you know, during the middle phase of the middle population size, it's still pretty high growth rates, but as you, as you approach the carrying capacity, what happens? It levels off. And eventually, where does it go? It actually goes to the limit, okay? And so this is what we call, this is kind of back to the, population genetics concepts, right? This is a stable equilibrium. So the idea here is that all, pop given this kind of, this is a deterministic equation, it's a very simple equation, the idea is that it asymptotes off and it eventually goes, all populations will go to their carrying capacity, okay? And the way to look at this is, let's just, let's just look at these values in here, okay? So let's start out where the population size is relatively low. If you think, or somewhere, let's do, let's actually do it right in here, right? Let's say the population size is 100 and the carrying capacity is 200, okay? If you do this value right here, if you take 200 minus 100 over 200, that's a 0.5 value, right? So whatever R times N, so you're, you're still getting some increase in the, gener the next generation after that. As you start getting closer and closer to that carrying capacity, what happens to this value here when you think about it? What, how about when k equals 200, it's the same. Now your population size is 190. It's getting fairly close to the carrying capacity. What's happening to that value? Is it becoming smaller, bigger, or the same? It's becoming smaller, right? So 200 minus 190 over 200 is a pretty small number, okay? So that, incre that, that value is getting smaller and smaller as you approach that carrying capacity. So it results in a smaller rate of change as you approach the carrying capacity. Now let's go, what, what if you get to 200? What happens to that value? It's zero, right? So that's no population size change, right? So 200 minus 200 over 200 is zero. So that, once it reaches that carrying capacity, that's a stable equilibrium and it'll, it'll be maintained at that population size, okay? What if you overshoot that carrying capacity? And that's often happens. What happens to that value? Yeah, so when you think about it, if 200 is carrying capacity, if you went up to 250, if you overshot the carrying capacity just for some random reason, what's the value? It's negative, and guess where it goes back to? So 200 minus 250 is minus 50 over 200, that's a negative value. What happens to the population size? Does it keep going up or does it go down? It goes back, basically what it does is if you overshoot it, say you went up here, right, where are you eventually gonna go? Down to here, okay? So again, that sort of, this is a deterministic equation, a differential equation that basically always goes to that carrying capacity, okay? Does that make sense, kind of? Okay, so, and this is, what we believe is more realistic in most populations, right? That populations do not grow without limit. They don't go to high levels. They actually often go to some sort of stable value. What that carrying capacity is varies a lot. It varies across, you know, if you have a, an environment that has a lot more resources, right? And re resources are replenished at a higher rate, you can probably reach a higher carrying capacity than one where resource availability is low. So a lot of this is variable. Okay, so this is what we call density. This is called population regulation. 
And we're going to talk about a lot of these things, but one of the things that we think is very important is that populations get regulated under what are called density dependence. And density dependent factors can bring a population under control. And one of the things that we were just talking about is that one of the most important density dependent factors that limits population size or regulates population size to some equilibrium is intraspecific competition. And that's what we kind of just showed. As more individuals get in the population, they're competing for more resources, there are higher levels of intraspecific competition, resource availability is limiting, and they kind of go to that equilibrium. And that's what we call density dependent population regulation. We'll also later talk about interspecific competition, right? As more individuals of another species are in an environment, it can limit the population growth rate of another species, and we'll be talking a lot about that too. We also imagine that as a population of a prey goes up, right, how do you think predators respond to that? They increase, they increase their attack rates, and we also think that predators are also, and parasites and diseases are also another thing that causes this sort of density dependent population regulation. We'll, be, we'll talking about, be talking about this next. These sorts of things, why do we call these density, these can limit population size or cause you know, the fact that exponential growth rate might not continue, it might be controlled. Why do we call these density independent factors, do you think? That's kind of a, so the idea here is that temperature and things like that, they might have an effect on a population, right? But it may, it may not be necessarily linked to the density of them, right? So if you have a really cold snap or a really hot snap, right, it could kill a lot of organisms, but it doesn't have anything to do with whether they're dense or not. And it could, but it, normally we think of it as not. Obviously, catastrophic events are random oftentimes, whether they're hurricanes or fires or things like that. Those things often cause populations to go down or to be regulated, but they're really kind of what we call density independent factors. They just happen randomly in their catastrophic events. So these are what we call density independent factors. So actually, how do we demonstrate sort of density dependent factors? And this is considered one of the classic examples, long study that was done, I can't remember. 1957, so we like to talk about old things, okay? This is a study that was done experimentally that has a lot of nice features, and let's kind of look at this. So these are Daphnia, these little water fleas. They're easy to raise in the lab. All of this was done in the lab, a real simple environment. You had Daphnia, you had water, and you had some resources that they feed upon, right? They're kind of, they kind of filter stuff out of the water and eat things out of the water. They're filter feeders. And so they set up these real simple lab experiments where they put these things in uh, little dishes uh, with different densities of individuals in these. These turn out, these are all clonal, parthenogenetic. They can, these are all female populations, so you can put one individual in there and they can reproduce just fine because they're all asexual, okay? So what they did is they looked at what happened to the survival probability over time from the time zero to about 40 to 50 days as a function of the density of those. So this is the survival probability. We'll look at that first. And then here is the progeny per female. So think about this is the fecundity per female as a function of the density that those females are in. Okay. This is not so obvious, the first one, okay, in terms of what happens. So let me ask you, what would you expect to happen? Where would you expect, to, in which density treatment would you expect the survival rate to be the lowest? So you have a range from one, four, six, one, two, four, eight, sixteen, and thirty-two individuals in a dish. The expectation might be that those would be those populations are the ones with the highest density. They're using resources. Mortality rates might be higher. Survivorship might be lower. Okay. So let's kind of look at that. Where's the thirty-two one? It's right here. It's that blue line right there. So in general, yeah, they have the lowest survivorship or the highest mortality early on. But then it gets a little messy out in here, okay? Where would you expect the highest survivorship or lowest mortality to be as a function of density? Yeah, well, it says eight. That wouldn't be my expectation. I would expect one, right? So where's one? Where is one? Oh, right, I can't even tell anymore. Right here, okay? 
So it doesn't fit exactly in terms of the, the, what you might expect, but in general, the lower densities, the one, two, four, and eight, tend to have kind of higher survivorship probability and lower mortality, but it's not real clean, okay? So this is a lot cleaner in terms of what happens to their fecundity. So let's look at where would you expect the fecundity to be highest over time? If, uh, which treatment should have the lowest competition for resources? Yeah, one. Is that what you see? Yeah, it kind of looks pretty good, right? There's the progeny per female. Uh, by about 10 or 11 days, they're up to above four, right? And they still remain the highest over time, okay? Which one has the lowest? 32. How did they do? So those females survived. How'd they do in terms of offspring production? The big zero. They did extremely, they didn't, in fact, did not reproduce at all. Okay? So here's, um, here's what's this one, 16. It had also reduced fecundity. And this pattern fits really well. Here's eight, here's four, here's two, and here's one. This really documented the density dependence, right? Those females that at low density had the highest reproductive rates, those females at the very high densities had very low fecundity and low reproduction. Okay. So you can actually take all this data, right, and do a life table, and I won't ask you to do that, but they actually determined sort of the, they did it with the lambda value rather than the small r. Okay. And here's what they found. So, do you guys want bonus points? Okay, one bonus point. I'm going to go through the example, but here's what they found. Here, here's the, uh, that lambda, the measure of population growth rate as a function of density. What's the relationship look like? Looks negative, doesn't it? So which ones had the highest population growth rate? One, two, four, and there's eight. There's 16, there's 32, okay? So this is what we call density dependence, right? The population growth rate changes as a function of the density of individuals in the population, okay? Okay, here's the question. Real simple, not real simple, okay. Tell me what's the carrying capacity of this environment? What is K? This will be the hardest part. And should I make it really hard? Yeah, let's make it really hard. So what's K? Looking at this graph, you should be able to figure it out. Give me the density that is K. And then everybody, you all think it's those populations down here have lower growth rates because of competition for food, right? Come up with an alternative that has nothing to do with food. So <laughs> that'll be hard. So what's K, and can you explain low population growth rate at high density besides competition for food? Okay. Try to do that. Let's try to do that in, I don't know, three to four minutes? Okay. This will be worth one. You want to talk about it, you two? Yeah. See what you come up with.
You all done? No? Two minutes. The alternative could be like, you know, two, two words. Yeah, you don't have to go into great detail. Is everybody in? Last call. Okay, what's the answer? What's the carrying capacity? Nope. 16? Nope. 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 Remember, that's kind of the state, that's where population is neither increasing or de decreasing, right? So anyway. 21, density. Okay. So remember, that's the population, remember population for the ge that lambda? So. so the idea here would be that eventually they would go back to that value. Okay, that was a hard one. Okay. What um what could cause that lower population growth rate besides resource competition? The size, of the size of the space, yeah, but then how would that so if you made it bigger it might, yeah, but okay. Huh? That's actually, yeah. So you'd have to know something about what was maybe they didn't get rid of all those disease, you know. Yep, that's a possibility. So also in a closed environment like that, especially if you're putting them in a petri dish and you put a bunch of individuals in there, not only are they depleting the food, what else do you do when you um, eat? Waste. Waste, there you go. 
So actually, one of the things that they think was probably the most critical thing was uh, the increase, um, especially in nitrogenous waste from all these individuals, and that basically that caused a lot of the problems beyond just the food. So it was believed to be a lot of, you know, the excretion and stuff like that. They didn't have a good, they had a, it was basically a closed system where there's nothing breaking down that nitrogenous waste and it was kind of accumulating. Of course, that's, that's kind of hard to get. That's good. Somebody came up, did anybody else come up with waste? Okay. No, no. Okay. You didn't either? Okay. 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 So yeah, okay. Let me, um, I'm gonna save this. And then we're gonna do an 